Good afternoon, everyone. Beautiful sunny day. Uh, I had some snow yesterday, but uh, it's gone. It's cold. Uh, I'm not sure what the temperature is right now because we're reading the garage temp, which is 30. So Google Maps says 26, so it's warmed up. Probably all it's going to warm up today. Down in the teens last night. Uh, Today's trip, uh, we're going to be checking out car chargers at car dealers in Boardman, Ohio. And uh, we'll probably go by the couple in Salem on the way. And uh, we'll talk about my electric background and what we're doing with the car for the winter. Uh, so far, definitely, uh, you got more of a consumption on electric for heating than you do AC. Here's a green and black. Tesla here, and you make it a turn, you probably won't see it. It's got a wrap on there that's pretty wild. I think I've seen it at Walmart. And the, the wrap wasn't uh, following all the contours real well. But it's like a... You definitely find your car in the snow, maybe not in Buffalo this weekend. So yeah, Buffalo gets snow like crazy, uh, five or six feet, depending on the area, four feet, uh, just varied all over the place. And uh, I'm seeing salt residue down, which I don't like. So probably well, it's going to warm up this week. I'll be washing the car. <clears throat> it's dry, but. Uh, me and the wife decided our new cars were going to be parking them mostly for the winter. Yeah, you can see the white residue. And, uh, same thing I did with the uh, the new Chevy Express van I got a couple years ago. Just uh, put all the seats back in, parked it for the winter, made sure everything was clean. We put it away and cleaned it again when we got it back out for spring. And of course, this past winter, February, I took it in for to trade in for this. Because we just weren't using all that space except for one kayak. <clears throat> so there's several car dealers that are showing, uh, and they're, they're all going to be level twos except for Nissan. And uh, we want to see how they are. We're going to test uh, probably starting with Subaru. Uh, we might go by the one at the motel in Columbiana and take a look. And. Uh, Perhaps test them. In fact, they're probably going to crank the heat up a little bit because we are kind of fully charged. So our consumption went way up because what I did is I set the uh, return climate. So uh, you got two return climate settings, and uh, you just set whatever temperature and time you think you're going to return. And I got one early in the morning and one sort of early middle at night. Since the car's going to be sitting there, we'll just charge it every few weeks, and then uh, the heater will come on a couple times a day. So we slowly cycle the battery. So with that running, it dropped from 4.1 to 3.1 or 4.2. So notice in a lot of cars like the Volkswagen van, they're just barely getting over one kilowatt or one mile per kilowatt hour. I was very interested in getting a pickup truck from the Ford or Chevy when they said there'd be 39, which they've already rate, rose the price. And then the com consumption is so bad, I don't really don't want anything to do with them. So they're going to have to reconfigure the front ends of all these cars for uh, aerodynamics. And since you don't need a, any cooling except for the battery. The whole front end needs to change like Tesla did. And the GM EV1. Even the Ford Probe was a wind tunnel test model before it went to production. So let's, uh, we'll circle into, I guess, Ford real quick and take a look. So Ford, you know, is running on Sundays and stuff. And twice we went to Jalisco's. 
So that's the other thing. I got to remember to turn my uh, charger timer off. I think I did when I reset everything. Well, I'll pull up here and check real quick before I go any further so I don't forget later. Yeah, sometimes if your charger's not working, you got to make sure you turn your timer, charger timer off. Oops. New York plates, it's got a truck park there. The Haliska, is it busy? They got a big hole in the road there, it needs fixed. So, yeah, Sunday we figure, hey, if this will let us know if they keep their chargers on for customers. You know, and this is a great day to look at cars when you don't want to talk with anybody. So, <clears throat> So that's been there. I guess I could ask for a test drive or something. So I'm going to go into my uh, gauges here. Go down to EV settings. Charge timer. It is on. We're going to knock that off. So it was on. So that's a pretty good level three. We've used it a few times. We've taken walks and gone shopping and stuff. Uh, the truck's never been for sale, so I'm not sure what the purpose is. Uh, it is a more expensive Lariat, I think is what it is. It's Lariat, uh, F-150 Lariat, instead of the Pro. So you're talking at least 70-some thousand. So. The light's on to charge. And we thank you, Ford. So I guess uh, they get the choice of cars if they're adopting the new way of doing things. They're going to get a choice before other car dealers, and they're going to try to phase anybody that's fighting them. Out. Holy mackerel, landing. <laughs> well, if you want to know how the heater works, I'm like, oh my god, I'm having a hot flash. Wow. Plus the turn into the sunshine. So, uh, 26 26 uh, Google. And uh, we are, we're going to have to turn it down some more or start derobing. <laughs> so, I wanted to burn some energy off. I guess I could lose like a sound in here. So yeah, the, uh, your heater doesn't run off the engine. The engine doesn't waste any energy to produce heat. So. Yeah, I decided, you know, I'm looking at these Chevy Bolts and stuff. I'm going to hang with this car, but I still want to test drive a Chevy Bolt UV. And then run this thing for another year or so. It's a great car. Um, from everything I've seen, it's uh, it's built better than Chevy, put together better than Chevy. Oh boy, I've been sneezing off and on this morning. So, a lot of people out shopping. Maybe they're getting stuff for Thanksgiving. Oh, thanks for pulling out. <laughs> hey, bring a trailer, grocery shopping. Oh, I got the sniffles. This has been going on an awful morning, I guess. Of course, it happens after I said leave. So, <clears throat> I maybe have to get licensed to sell electricity. Maybe that's why this isn't known. They said the end of August when I called in June. <laughs> they didn't say which August. And I'm not seeing anything. I think I got out last time or whatever. There was nothing going on. So, Blink, that's mostly found in Canada. I did get the app for some reason waiting and there's nothing going on. Oh, thank God for that. Fast food places are a little skimpy on some of the uh, condiments, but <clears throat> this summer they're handing out napkins by the handful for some reason. Maybe they look at me and say, hey, well, that's a slaughter. 
kick with my hand pulling the hammer down. <clears throat> and there's that New York guy going by. Huh. So there's two chargers in Salem. Ford officially, as far as I know, has the first car charger, but it's level two, free for customers and other people. And then, uh, Advanced Dermatology's got the first quick charger, but, uh, <laughs> we walk around the building, look for the switch. It's not on. So we're not sure what, uh, red tape the government put in front of them for that. So if, if they're not licensed to sell electric or something like that, they can probably call Blink have them fired it up and then just uh, have Link pay them a percentage and everything for keeping it on their property. The gas dropped for some reason this last week. <laughs> like what, 60 cents? Wow, look at all the people getting ready for Thanksgiving here. So if I go here, I like to go six, seven in the morning and then uh, I pay the extra money to do Sam's Club at eight in the morning. People. Look at the salt. There was nothing going on enough to have this much salt laying around. They send people out and they probably have a quota to lay down on the roads and all that's just going to go into the water supply. It's all going to go to waste. Uh, they could have done that with uh, something besides salt. Thought they'd be a little bit, they dumped a shitload of salt, excuse the language. <clears throat> so we got this car, we got a background in electrical, electronic, and stuff. I don't know why. Uh, my first experience is with electricity. I actually hate the stuff. <laughs> I hate electricity. Despise it. Maybe I learned all this so I could avoid stuff that happened to me as a child or whatever so I was real young I think I was left alone or something at my grandfather's grandparents place wow need to be pulled over for lights you can see the little one blink but not the big one So I don't know what I was, uh, maybe dad's tape recorder, something that dad's or grandpa's was plugged in the living room. <clears throat> I went to unplug it and the whole outlet came out from the wall. Like, oh dear God. And when I went to put it back in, I got the worst shock of my life where I'm just laying there like, ah, ah. And I still didn't get it back in all the way. So putting it in all the way, I got another shock and I'm laying there for a longer time. Like, what the living hell? You actually had to put your hand on the outlet to unplug anything because it's coming out of the wall. And uh, I don't remember what it exactly looked like because I was pretty damn young in grade school. And uh, it pretty much convinced me, you know, maybe I had two hands to barely live through that or something. It was the worst shock in my life. It's like, you know, like, uh, self-tasing yourself. So I did this thing at junior high school where they hand crank some kind of generator and have everybody hold hands. And I said, no way in hell. Dear God. <laughs> I am not volunteering for any shock therapy no matter what the tingle. The only thing I did was, you know, test the uh, Radio Shack battery on the tongue all those years, the nine volts. But that's it out of that, maybe. <clears throat> A couple beers, maybe I'd be doing it again. <clears throat> so, trade school, electronics. Military electronics, military avionics, navigation systems. Radar. Instrument landing. VOR, which they still use on civilian air and military. Marker beacon, all that wonderful stuff. Uh, 
then out of the military to the B1B program where uh, I ended up on a crew of people from the space shuttle on uh, B1B aircraft 5 in no actually November 1985 after three weeks of the uh, classes across the one runway uh, Air Force Plan 42 they sent us out there and basically we just uh, were trying to tape up open panels on our plane for the weekend and uh, I'm with a tall lean guy and he's got he's got alcohol aluminum tape and some kind of plastic or plastic bags and uh, nothing sticking to the aircraft real quick because it's all uh, radar absorbing finish on there and we do the best we can and that weekend I'm working aircraft four and uh, anytime they ask me to work I said yeah I'll I just came out of the military where they didn't ask you to work. They just said, hey, you're working. Oh, come on, red car. So volunteering to work overtime was like, yeah. And they're going to pay me more. The military never paid you anymore. So this uh, group... As space shuttle workers, including the supervisor, were just a pretty incredible bunch. Real easy going because the space shuttle, you don't do much. Uh, you might get a job to put a unit in a space shuttle. You check the area it goes in to make sure it goes in, get all the paperwork right and everything you need for the uh, Rockwell inspector. And then uh, if he okays everything, and uh, you got nothing in your pockets, you got a bunny suit on, you can't leave, bring anything in that's just not marked down, because uh, it's not good to bring, you know, extra little things to space. <clears throat> that could cause problems, especially zero gravity and air aircraft, it's like inverted flight trouble. So there's this group of people, and there's, uh, you just picture them traveling across the country in the late 60s, early 70s in a Volkswagen van. They were like hippie-like people. And just the nicest, greatest group of people you could ever hope for. And nothing bothered them. It's just a, just a wonderful people. And the older lady that was with them for a little bit called Mary, uh, she wore that uh, perfume that used to make you sick in church on Sundays. And then amplify that if you end up in the cockpit with her. And you, you start seeing hallucinations and get a little tipsy and stuff. So, this one guy named Sergio, a real old guy, probably pushing 40 <laughs> back then, had a reddish beard. He took me under his wing. I think he, he had a guitar there at work from the shuttle. That's how easy going they were. He introduced me to everybody at that site I needed to I needed to know the tool crib, the print people, everybody to get things done, to get what I needed toward me of the uh, space shuttle facility and uh, the, the hangar on site uh, where the uh, primer planes were, were uh, testing the fuel tanks, fuel cells and stuff before they left our site, went to another site to contain it. So he lined me up how to get everything, do everything. And uh, just valuable. And he took me under his wing to be a cockpit operator. And he, he would fall asleep. So I would sit there and look at every panel, memorize every panel, every switch and knob on every panel. So <clears throat> just in two days when the aircraft manager would call or the uh, designated engineer system you're working on. I knew exactly where the switch was. And right away, I was actually pointing stuff out to Sergio because he'd be looking for it. I'd point it out to him as he was waking up. A real 
lost on that. And then yeah, about a month behind me, we had an F-15 electrician come out of the Air Force, and uh, he taught me everything about being an aircraft electrician. So between those two things, I was just set to go, and plus uh, doing bench work and learning so much of the military, and then uh, we were at test base for a new piece of equipment, and it showed up there, and that made me made me real valuable because nobody else knew how to use it. I had to teach engineers the avionics systems and teach the engineers how to use this test equipment. So it was a pretty awesome experience. It got me a higher clearance. And then the guy from the F-15, they said, well, you're going to need somebody to work with you or an alternate, and you get to pick who you want. So we both went off to get these higher clearances and that was pretty cool. So to be one, it's like one of those jobs. It's probably like the ultimate job in a lifetime. It's just everything I've done in my childhood, teenage years, and just worked out all to complete that job. Even doing the darkroom stuff at home came in handy in doing fuel tanks, being able to, to take a glance at something and know where everything was within the dark or, where your, or when your eyes were closed. So I went on to Douglas to be an aircraft inspector and they were like the elite, some elite group and all that. They inspected all the engineer work, all the engineer drawings, all the designs, electrical and electronic, before they were okay to go on the aircraft. So I was inspecting uh, draftsman's drawings, engineering drawings, engineering orders, blueprints. Uh, everything went through us. And every new installation on a plane had to go through us through the first two times. <clears throat> and her counterpart that was working in China on the MD-80 program, she came back and uh, the building manager, she was training all the new people behind me. Building manager got on her one day for all these people and he was just a ruthless guy pulled the doors off the bathroom stalls. So there's the charger and it's being iced by a Chevy. I'll pull around and she'll show you this black Chevy. So it's probably for customers only, but uh, you don't park in front of a car charger. So here's the location, and uh, there's the Chevy blocking it and stuff. So yeah, this building manager, she gets he gets on this lady that returns from China. She's actually 69 years old at the time. Her whole, seems like her whole family worked at the plant. And uh, she had sons that were managers and supervisors. And uh, if you want to get to know her, you get the 1988 issue of Life with Elvis Presley's wife and daughter on it and she's listed in there about Americans working overseas. That's pretty cool. I did some write-ups on an installation on the MD-80 assembly building and uh, I got in trouble for my lead man on how to do a write-up and I went over the top and everything and I guess she used those write-ups to teach those new people it was the, like a perfect example I know how to write up stuff so you would write up something and you'd give the XYZ location which is the you know, left right top to bottom 
you know, the water line and then from the nose to the back. And then you list the uh, blueprint number and the zone it's found on. And then what the violation was at Douglas Process Standards, which was uh, DPS 1834 for civilian, 134 for military. And uh, everything was there. Three write ups, all perfectly done, textbook. So what one guy said I did wrong, another one used my examples to train the people. And they got rid of the building manager because she was real valuable. So they passed me and put on the brakes and they're not going that fast now. So her name was Virginia Funches. <clears throat> She'd been at Douglas for almost 40 years. And then there was a uh, pretty much the head lead number one inspector in the old plant took me under his wing there and uh, taught me everything told me history we even went through the, uh, the official history at Douglas had redlined and made the corrections according to him so I asked him what <laughs> What was the best plane? What was the most exciting project you ever did at Douglas Aircraft for the 42 years on your badge? And he says, he says, actually, the best thing I ever worked on was the North American Aviation before I came to Douglas. I said, oh, dear God, there's four. Because that's where I came from, was in Rockland. I was like, oh, my God. So we even got along better. So he was a real quiet guy, and he went off to do all the stuff other people wouldn't do all by himself all day, like... Uh, interior flammability and stuff. Uh, and whatever they asked him to do. So I did real well there. Some really wonderful people. And then I got tired of the commute, went back to Rockwell to be a tech writer on the B1. And it was, uh, uh, they never taught us really what to do because the people they were supposed to teach us they were so overloaded with work they weren't around but basically they had to look uh, an office thing where these guys would come out with tech orders and our job was to go through and make all the corrections because they were just putting stuff together you know do the first writing and then we would get it ready for the second inspection and then the final but uh, really didn't know completely what we're doing I, all the overtime there was free like the military that they promised but it was close to home but when the wife went to take her second job I said no nah, this is so we moved to Seattle and I worked up there for until I got laid off I went back to Douglas uh, Seattle we worked uh, flight test mainly there for the new 747-400s last thing I worked on was the E-6A Navy submarine communications plane. And favorite plane was the 757 while I was there. Never worked a 767. The first day was at Seattle Field, which our headquarters in the B-52 hangar. They sent me to Everett, report the second day of work, so I moved the family to a motel in Everett get to Everett and they gave me a, a, a slip to go to Renton for my third day of work. So all three plants in three days. Rever, Re, uh, Renton was a paradise. There was no gate, no security gate you had to go through. You could park behind the plane you're working on. The trouble is the Green River flowed there while the bodies were probably floating by and we'd ate lunch on the Green River. <laughs> if you've heard of the Green River killer and stuff. I would get weird looks saying I went boating or water skiing on uh, what was it, Lake Sammamish. i say, hey, there's nobody out there. And nobody told me that the Ted Bundy thing kind of kept people from going to Lake Sammamish. So Boeing had a thing that pay you to move back or whatever if you had there less than a year. They, they moved me and did and everything to go up there. 
and then uh, I interviewed with Northrop with a full-on flu. First time I took their flu and a bunch of Tylenol to get through that interview. So you imagine how that went? They never called. And then Douglas showed up and for wanted a flight line electrician. So I told him names of all their paperwork, their programs, and everything. And uh, I got after quitting, they hired me back at three dollars over what I quit at, and then told me there'd be another three dollars within a few months when the uh, UAW contract ended and renewed. So that was pretty cool. And uh, I think I only had one or two electrical problems at work at uh, Boeing because they were put together so perfectly. But Douglas, <laughs> they didn't know what they were. They really lost their way since the uh, propeller days. Which I love because it kept me busy doing electrical work. And then back to Salem or whatever after a few layoffs after the C-17 and all that. And then uh, classes on being a segment for the railroad. So a lot of electrical, electronic experience. And the electrical car things kind of lit a spark in me. You know, hey, why not do that? Why? Been doing the same thing for years, waiting for something to come along. Cars have been lost their excitement in the 70s greatly, and I've never really been interested in them. They've been nothing but a pain in the rear end. <clears throat> so even the new ICE cars or whatever got a lot of neat functions on them and stuff. So I've got this book from Shell. Tell you what, I'm going to cut out for a second and cut back on so we're not just dragging on one long video. So it's just going to be a second.